Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Robert Daly. I direct the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Wilson Center, and we are delighted that you can be with us and that Jude Blanchett can be with us for the launch of his new book, China's New Red Guards, The Return of Radicalism and the Rebirth of Mao Zedong. Uh, Jude, as many of you know, is senior advisor and China practice lead at the, uh, the Crompton, Crompton Group, which is a geopolitical risk advisory, but he wears a great many other hats as well. He is now an adjunct fellow in the Asia Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Previously, he was at the conference board's China Center for Economics and Business in Beijing, where he led the center's search, uh, research on the Chinese political environment and focused particularly on the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party. Before that, he was assistant director of the 21st Century China Center at UC San Diego. He has recently been named as a fellow in the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations Public Intellectuals Program. Congratulations to them on that and having the wisdom to select you and, and to you as well. That's a wonderful uh, group that we often welcome here at the Wilson Center. He uh, is or has been, are you still on the board of the American Mandarin Society? I am still, yes. We haven't met for a while. Yeah. We're both on the board of the American Mandarin well the Society. Board communicates. Right. <laughs> but, but it effectively, we are dedicated to trying to help people who are now professionals, who have spent a lot of time in the trenches doing pattern drills in Mandarin, to improve and use Chinese as part of their professional practice. And one of the reasons that Jude is on that board uh, is because his, his Mandarin is so good, and I suspect that that was part of what went into the research methodology for this book, again, China's New Red Guards. In bringing this discussion of neo-Maoism to the Wilson Center, the Kissinger Institute is breaking its usual rules or perhaps uh, making a new rule. We usually focus on issues in U.S.-China relations, and we have tended uh, not to focus on China qua China and what's going on within China's borders. Um, we, I think we need to rethink that and to pay particular attention to uh, political and intellectual trends, the thought landscape in China, which is diverse, changing rapidly, and has a very strong impact on U.S.-China relations. And that, for me, was one of the great values in, in reading this book, uh, which the longer I read it, the more I thought of it, and I don't know if you're going to like this comparison or not, but it was sort of a companion piece, and almost a mirror image uh, to Perry Link's Evening Chats in Beijing, in which he did a deep dive on uh, the disaffected, uh, disgruntled liberals around the period of May 4th, and here we've got the other side, which are the neo-Maoists who were always there, including in that earlier period, uh, at times equally disgruntled and maybe now perhaps more gruntled as their ideas uh, come to the fore. And that, I, I would say, is one of the great values and, and pleasures of this book. So I hope that you will keep this up uh, going forward and help us to keep track of what people are actually thinking, uh, the complexity of their thought within China, because this is almost always missed here in the United States uh, as we form policy. So what we'd like to do this morning, as I said, is have a discussion. Uh, I'm going to start by asking uh, Jude to maybe give us a brief, quick historical overview of the neo-Maoists and the mainstreams of their thinking, how it matters now. And then I have a few questions for you, but then would very much like to open it up uh, to the group. There's a lot of China expertise and experience uh, here in the audience. And so I'm sure that you have uh, met with folks of these sorts or have had contact with this strain of thinking in China uh, for many years, and you'll have questions for Jude. So if you could begin sort of with the overview, we'd appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Robert. And, and it's, a great, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I know it's standard to insert sort of a joke about thanking everyone for being here with the nice weather, but um, so nice out that Katie and I, my wife, we thought about not coming and just, <laughs> just staying home. So um, yeah, and, and, and um, want to say that the Wilson Center is, is my, my, my most important title, in addition to the ones that Robert mentioned, is, is uh, as the husband of, of Katie Stoddard Blanchett, who's a fellow here at the, uh, at the Wilson Center. So this, this place has become uh, really special to, to both of us, and it's a, it's a great honor to be doing uh, my, first, uh, my first book event. But it's pure merit. There's no nepotism. Absolutely. In yes. This. Sorry, I, I stepped into that one. Um, <laughs> so I, maybe I think the, the place to start here is on my own journey to understanding and getting interesting about the, uh, the neo-Maoists. Um, and the book ended up in a different place given the uh, political trajectory change in China over the past couple of years. But when I started 
getting interested in neo-Maoists, it was around 2010, 2011, when um, Bo Xilai was the party secretary out in Chongqing. And I think that's when most of us began hearing about these younger, educated, tech-savvy individuals who were hearkening back to and celebrating the culture of Mao Zedong. And this was quite jarring for me uh, because I had, by that point, had been studying and studying and living and working in China for about, uh, for about five or six years now. And that just didn't comport with my own understanding of where China was headed. Um, it seemed like integration and access to uh, increasing amounts of information, information technology, interactions with the outside world would inevitably and inexorably bend China's uh, trajectory and ideological trajectory towards one that uh, maybe wasn't quote unquote like us, but it was at least more familiar to us. And yet here were these young individuals who were talking about returning China to some sort of proto-Maoism. And so that's when I began investigating this and, and talking to them and spent the next four or five years in a dialogue with these individuals and found them to be, um, despite having a politics that are very different from my own, really fascinating individuals and complex individuals who taught me a lot about uh, the intricacies and complexities and unpredictabilities of, of China as, as a country. It returned, I think, or at least reemphasized the idea of agency in Chinese, uh, especially in regards to political discourse and, and conversations, which I had forgotten. You know, I think a lot of us have this idea that one party state, the Communist Party controls everything, controls propaganda. These heuristics we'd, we'd heard about, uh, you know, the Chinese people are in this unspoken contract where they pursue their own economic activity and the, the Communist Party, and in return, the, you know, the Communist Party asks that they don't get involved in politics, these sort of, these sort of cliches. And yet here was this group of individuals who were deeply invested in contesting the direction that China's political system was going, but uniquely or interestingly contesting it in a way that wanted to move it further away from constitutional democracy or limited government or free trade. Uh, so that's how this, that's how this began. Um, and by the end of it, and I don't want to spoil uh, the book, but this really isn't a plot-driven one, so you can just read the introduction and toss it aside. But um, what changed about that narrative is uh, China's political system over the past uh, two or three years has really gone under, undergone a, a pretty remarkable transformation. And I, for us that were watching China uh, and watching this new leader, Xi Jinping, who came to power in, in late 2012, I think it took, a, it took a, me at least a few years to, to get a better reckoning of who this individual was and where he wanted to take the country. But looking back over my notes in discussions with some of these neo-Maoists, I realized that uh, they saw it right away. And uh, there's a, a story, um, a, a young neo-Maoist called Suma Pingbang told me uh, that he was at an event in late 2013. It was uh, December 26th, which is the anniversary of Mao Zedong's birth. And he was at an event in Beijing in a second-rate rundown conference room in a, in a motel. And it was, uh, it was a calligraphy exhibition, but rather a sad, pathetic affair uh, of sort of some neo-Maoists. And in the corner, they had a, a TV. And it suddenly showed Xi Jinping and the rest of the, the standing committee of the, of, the, of the Politburo, sort of the apex of power in, in the Communist Party, all lining up to go see Mao Zedong's body uh, in, in the center of Tiananmen Square. And Sima Pingbang told me that he looked around the room and there were tears streaming down the faces of uh, everyone in the room who was looking up at this and, and uh, seeing a leader who, to them, was finally accepting and was proud of China's, uh, China's Maoist heritage and, and the, uh, the political, uh, uh, political legacies of, of China. And so uh, Sima Ping Bang, Bang told me it was that day that he understood uh, who Xi Jinping was. Uh, and that sounds a little bit like Bush saying he looked into Putin's eyes and saw the making of the man, but I think the neo-Maoists understood quite, quite early uh, that this was a political leader who was looking to take, chi take China's uh, uh, political system in, in, in a new direction, and Xi Jinping cer certainly has done that. Um, so uh, I feel like I could be rambling, so I'll look to Robert to see if uh, we, we want to get into some, uh, some Not dialogue. rambling at all, but if I could, uh, the, the thrust of your discussion so far leads to a question. We all read that Xi Jinping is making enhanced use of, of party cells, of a cult of personality, that he has asked not only think tanks and universities, but uh, the creative class and journalists uh, now to uphold socialism with Chinese characteristics and to serve the people. 
And so the direction of your remarks just now raised the question of whether Xi Jinping is himself a neo-Maoist. Mm. Uh, and if he is a neo-Maoist, uh, why are they rounding up some of the young Marxists yeah. on Chinese college campuses who are advocating uh, for Chinese laborers against Chinese capitalists? Could you just follow that thread of where Xi Jinping fits into this in intellectually? Where yeah. is he? So the, the short answer is, um, let me take out the neo and just say, is Xi Jinping a Maoist? We'll start, we'll start there, and maybe we can then move definitionally to what we mean when we say the word neo-Maoist. Um, we, we hear a lot about Xi Jinping as the strongest political, since, political leader since Mao Zedong. We hear about this resurgence of ideology under, under Xi Jinping's rule. Um, we're, we, we as outsiders are always scrambling for the, the right analogy uh, or metaphor to make sense in of China, which is why we're often referring to these historical characters. Um, it is certainly not the case that, that Xi Jinping is going to be advocating for Red Guards to be marching into the streets to, to overthrow the Communist Party or to rectify the party, as, as Mao used to say. Um, we've seen that stability maintenance uh, has always been important to the Communist Party, especially after 1989. It's very important to Xi Jinping. So he's not looking to unleash a, a, a sort of revolutionary tide upon the country. What does the neo do? What does that prefix neo do when we talk about uh, Maoist? Uh, a a neo-Maoist is a, a, mar a time marker of some extent. It talks about a, a new evolution of intellectuals and individuals and activists who have affinities for China's revolutionary history but have adapted it to a, a certain moment in time. Neo-Maoists emerged uh, around the turn of the century, around 2002, 2003, uh, out of dissatisfaction with China's reform trajectory, a feeling that uh, too much credence had been given to the market economy to allocate resources, a belief that the Communist Party had ceded too much ground and too much control over propaganda, over ideology, too much autonomy had been given to the private sector, to actual firms, uh, that the party had just has essentially lost its, its commanding heights position to, to oversee and control. Um, that's what we mean when we talk about neo-Maoism in many cases. And, and if that's our definition, then in many ways Xi Jinping would, would fit that. He's someone who has renegotiated the position of the Communist Party to give it much more influence and oversight over, uh, over Chinese society and Chinese economy. North, south, east, west, the party controls everything, as, as Xi Jinping said at the, uh, at the 19th Party Congress in, in, in late 20, 2018, 2017. Um, clearly feels like the, the market economy had been given too much autonomy and is trying to renegotiate that balance between control and openness needed for innovation. That, that's been an ongoing, uh, ongoing rebalancing act that the Communist Party has been going through since at least uh, the late 1970s. Xi Jinping has clearly pulled that back more towards state guidance and control, uh, top-down planning. Um, Party cells, uh, any organization, entity, baseball team, church, you name it in China that has more than three Communist Party members with it within that entity has to, uh, by, by party guidelines, have to have a, a party organization. That had long been forgotten and ignored. Uh, it was possible to have a private company in China four or five years ago that had an inactive, dormant, or non-existent party organization. That's not the case today. We're seeing a, a real reintegration of the party into the private sector. So in that case, uh, and by those limited definitions, I'd say, sure, we could say Xi Jinping is a, uh, is, is a neo-Maoist, uh, lowercase n, lowercase m. But, but to Robert's uh, point, there's clearly thresholds and, uh, and red lines for Xi Jinping. And, and this is the core tension, I think, of the book and, and of neo-Maoism. On the one hand, you've got a group of individuals who are, who are celebrating the fact that you have a leader in China who is who is not, who, excuse me, who is proud of the red legacy, who is, who is, who is not afraid of talking about some types of, uh, some areas of Mao Zedong's rule, others he'd prefer to forget, but is trying to essentially do a Bushy Lai 2.0 of celebrating this red culture. But on the other hand, Mao is a tricky individual, and there are certain types of Maoism that the party would rather see forgotten. And, and the, the Zalfan Yoli, to revolt, to, to revolt is right, 
the, sort of the radical revolutionary element of Maoism is one the party would, would prefer to, to control and contain. But that tension is always there, and the neo-Maoists epitomize that. So um, as, as many of us are aware, there's been a, over the past year or so, there's been a movement, uh, integration between elite student at Marxist activists at some of Chinese best, China's best universities and this labor unrest in southern China. Um, the neo-Maoist organizations have been an important part of this. And this, um, this activism led to one of the most severe and pronounced recent crackdowns uh, in, in China's, uh, you know, in recent memory. Um, and it, it, it is one that I think um, really gets to heart of this, this tension between you have a communist party of China that articulates a quote-unquote socialist vision for the country. But when you see students take that seriously and, and draw from that Marxist-Maoist legacy and try to help uh, the workers, the peasants, uh, who are ostensibly the revolution was started for, you see the stability maintenance part of the party uh, get nervous and, and, and kick in. So, yeah. And the, the neo-Maoists, you actually trace them back, uh, you just said turn of the century, but you actually go back into the 90s with the China Can Say No right. and the books that came out of all of that. Are the neo-Maoists a niche mm. subculture? What is their reception popularly and among other intellectuals? Are, are they having more of an impact or are they regarded as those guys above the utopia mm. tea house or whatever it is uh, that you describe? Certainly in popular culture, uh, we see the party making use of some of the neo-Maoist ideas, uh, most recently uh, showing old Chinese films from the Korean War, the 1956 uh, Battle of, of Shangangling to sort of steal the Chinese people to this long competition with the United States. Uh, the propaganda organs are hearkening back. Is neo-Maoism now popular, or does it have sort of an elite intellectual core and a watered-down popular version? And then I guess related to that, who do the neo-Maoists now see themselves primarily as arguing against? Mm. Are they arguing yeah, against liberals? Mainstream party members that think have gone wrong? Do they see themselves arguing as they have in the past against the United States and global liberalism? Where do they position themselves? So popular or no? And, and who, are they, who are they arguing against? Uh, yeah, great questions. Um, I'm just writing these down so I don't forget. So popular or no? Um, I, I think it's, um, and maybe I should have done this at the opening remarks, to contextualize um, contextualize neo-Maoism as, as an important strain of the the post Mao, uh, post-1976, that is to say, intellectual discussion and political debate in China. Um, my understanding until I started working on this book was, uh, as, a, as a casual student of China, 1976 Mao dies, late 1970s, 1978, the third plenum meeting, Deng comes to power, launches reform, reform and opening, it's sort of upward and onward, this very linear trajectory through the 1980s. 1989, June 4th, you get this, you get this dip as you have this the, the crackdown uh, against the student demonstrators. But then uh, Deng Xiaoping goes on his celebrated 1992 uh, Southern tour, revised the reform legacy, and it's upward and onward. WTO entrance accession in, in, in 2001. 2002, the three represents where the Communist Party allows capitalists into, into the Communist Party. That, that was my very simplistic narrative. And what I came to understand is from the, the very beginning of the reforms, um, right away there was intense pushback. Uh, that, that the reforms, while on net, certainly China reformed over the past uh, four decades and, and to a, a remarkable degree, it was always much more volatile than I had understood. There was this push-pull cyclical, um, or what, what one conservative, Deng Lichun, called this feng and show, this uh, opening and, and contraction. Uh, cyclical element to it. And so you would see this sort of two steps forward, one step back, two steps back, three steps forward uh, debate that was going on all throughout uh, the 80s, 90s, and, and even the 2000s. And what was driving it was reform created costs, uh, reform created losers. And that we typically as, or I, sorry, I typically as an American always look out for in any country who's the reformer and, and look out for the liberalizations. Um, and really emphasize the growing pie, missing that in any, in any one of these growing pie scenarios, there are individuals from the old, from the, the status quo ante who are, who are losing as a part of that. And with the reform agenda, you had vast swaths of government bureaucrats, cadres, 
who, as liberalization uh, was spreading, saw their position in power and their position in society radically uh, changed, altered, and they saw their, their rent-seeking ability diminished. You had tens of millions of workers in the old state-owned economy who, beginning in the mid-1990s under the SOE privatization, suddenly found themselves out of work and, and the social contract that they thought they had bought into of, uh, uh, of you give your life, you join, a, you join an SOE and you're given full employment, you're given health care, you're given education. Suddenly the, the Communist Party, again, the Communist Party comes along and says, we need more productivity in our state-owned sector. We need to, we need to uh, create some mass layoffs to free up labor to move into the new private economy. That was shocking and jarring for people. So neo-Maoism essentially is, the, is a later incarnation of that very old debate that's been happening of those who feel like China's reform trajectory is creating too many losers, those who look at SOE privatization, who look at the sort of growth at all costs economic policy under the Communist Party, and argue that instead of, uh, instead of pursuing that, that form of state to proto-capitalism that China needs to adhere to or stick to a, a, a more soci socialist, uh, socialist vision for China's economy. That's what neo-Maoism is, is essentially. Um, and that's what it's drawn out of, if that much, that's much older debate. What's different about neo-Maoism is they also understood that Mao Zedong, the, the imagery, the person, the symbolism was, an, was a powerful tactical tool in pushing back against the Communist Party. It makes it harder for a Communist Party to crack down on demonstrators when they're marching through the streets with banners uh, of, of holding a Mao Zedong picture above them. Not impossible, and we've seen the party crack down on them, but at least raises the cost uh, raises the cost of that coercion on, on behalf of the party. And so neo Maoists consciously adopted Mao as a symbol. But even going back earlier, in 1979, Deng Xiaoping gives a, there's a speech in his collected works where he says, there are those who are holding up the banner of Mao to oppose our reforms. What he meant is there, there are those utilizing the symbolism of Mao Zedong, quoting Mao, uh, um, Holding, holding up Mao banners and posters uh, at the democracy wall in 1979. There were people who were un under the guise of a Mao quote actually critiquing the reform agenda. So this is an older, uh, this is an older form of political advocacy or contest contestation in China's political system. It's just the neo-Mao has sort of digitalized it. Um, so the question of popular or no, if we're just looking or defining popularity by number of hits a, a website gets, then this is a, this is a, a really marginal group. Right? This doesn't have actually much power. And if we were, look, if we were to look at, um, did, have the Maoists bent the policy trajectory? Can we trace clear victories to neo-Maoist agitation? That's, that's, that's hard to do. Um, China's political system, like most political systems, is, is primarily influenced by elite interests. But if we think about neo-Maoism as a representation of um, broader uh, concerns or criticisms of, of China's economy, uh, broader concerns or criticisms about the, the treatment of, of migrant workers, for example, uh, then I think neo-Maoism is one of the few open political movements that is articulating uh, these concerns. Uh, I, come, uh, I come from a more rightist, capitalist, reactionary uh, uh, ideological corner, and so my, the, the intellectuals in China who I had always been following, uh, Mao Yushu, uh, Zhang Weiying, um, didn't talk or didn't really address centrally the concerns that the neo-Maoists always, uh, always brought to the fore. Um, they were more concerned about expanding the size of the pie. You know, Zhang Weiying is a powerful advocate for increasing market reform. So that, that's his primary goal, um, but doesn't pay much attention to the distribution of, of, of the pie. And so the neo-Maoists have, have been, uh, you know, uh, front and center in making sure that that social agenda is, is, uh, is kept alive. You spend some time describing this 2006 uh, Western Hills meeting, the, the, the Xishan Hui, at which, among other things, the neo-Maoists begin to say that conflict between the United States and China is inevitable. Uh, these folks, as, as, as quoted and described by you, can sound fairly extreme. They can sound sort of dangerous. They can sound violent. Uh, but you've also spent a lot of time with them. And I, you don't say this in the book, but I get the sense uh, that you like them and that they liked you. Uh, we tend, when we speak of people like neo-Maoists in the United States, to demonize them. But could you tell us, when you're with them, um, I assume that they don't have horns and hooves, uh, are they, do they walk the walk? Are they, for example, are they technological Luddites? Mm -hmm. Are they radical egalitarians? Uh, do they wear Mao suits? At the personal level, could you help give, give us a feel for, for who these people are, how they live, and where their convictions come from? 
Yeah, I certainly can't say with any accuracy if they like me, but um, <laughs> but 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 I indeed like they them. They give you a lot of their time. Um, yeah, that's 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 for sure. I think um, you know to Robert's point, it, it's. Um, some incredibly extreme things are written on neo Maoist websites, including about uh, the United States and, and where they'd like uh, U.S. relations to go, which is not a particularly uh, pretty place. But nonetheless, when you sit down with these people, uh, um, you know, runs the gamut of, of all human interactions. But, but almost to the person, I found them to be very engaging, very interesting, soft-spoken, um, deeply concerned about where China was going. Um, although these ideological convictions been, can be quite extreme, um, they come from a place out of deep concern for where China China is heading. Um, and so that was, I think that's quite interesting. And it's actually, um, um, in many ways, it sort of reframes how I look at, you know, in the United States, we're now in a quite polarized era. And it frames how I look at people who have vastly different political opinions from, from myself. Just just this one experience with, with being with Neo Maoists has taught me that... Um, we, we can sort of agree to disagree, but there's a, still a, a shared personal connection. And, and not to take this in a different tangent, but, but as you see the United States and China really careening towards something quite nasty at a very rapid pace, um, keeping in, in our own heads the, the quite human interactions we have on, uh, with our friends on either side, I think is going to become in increasingly important because we're now moving towards an era of abstractions, you know, U.S. versus China, Communist Party, Trump administration, and it's quite easy to, to lose a grasp on humanity. So, so um, again, although uh, I, I certainly won't um, uh, condone most of the things I read on neo Maoist websites, uh, it was interesting to see the humans behind, uh, behind these policy positions. I think that's a great note on which to open this up uh, to the audience. Yes, sir. Hey, boy, Jim. Uh, the question I've got for you is, first of all, taking the premises in your book. So wait, could we, could we get our, is there a microphone? Oh, sorry. Beg your pardon, Congressman. Taking the premises in your book, the ratchet is only going to go one way, if you look at it, because the only space that's open by Chinese socialism is for the neo Maoists. So if, if the future is one of continuing only to ratchet and that there's no way for the communication to push back, mm. uh, that would be one concern. The qu second question I've got is one of the things I've noticed is the pushback against U.S. employers who pay too much. Uh, in spe specifically, the state moving in cases where they were driving wage rates up rather than down. Now, this is anecdotal information, but based upon the cases I've worked on, it looks as though there isn't as much enthusiasm for having real wage rate gains because the state-owned enterprises, the state-owned enterprises right. stand to benefit from keeping wage rates down because they get a larger and larger market share so why would they go to bat for labor in China? Got it. So you're talking about uh, uh, state-owned enterprises in China who are concerned about rising wage rates? Right. Got it. Okay. Well, the party's view of that. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, Chairman Royce. Um, on the on the first question, the, the ratchet going one way. Um, yeah. Again, if we think about these, uh, use a different metaphor. The the pendulum swings that are, have been a constant occurrence in, in China's the past four decades, where we've seen reformers sometimes on the insurgents, and then that's swung back to, to conservatives or anti-reformers or reactionaries. I, I agree that looking at past swings in the pendulum, we could, our, we could identify and articulate who the powerful individuals were in the opposing camp who had the authority to wrench it back in the other direction, right? So if, and again, using the conserv conservative reformer dichotomy is, is incredibly simplistic. Um, and there's no doubt smarter people in the room who are gonna poke holes in, in that clear delineation. But um, it's difficult to see now. We often talk about you know, reformers in the system and anyone who travels to China, you, you, you absolutely can meet individuals who are concerned about the direction China is going. The question is, who in a significant position of authority has the institutional and bureaucratic heft to push back or, or uh, alter the direction of China's policy trajectory right now? Um, we don't, so throughout the 80s and 90s, throughout the 80s, for example, we could think of these elders within the party who, who had the street cred, revolutionary street cred, uh, akin to or similar to, even if, if down a couple notches from a Deng Xiaoping. Right? We're talking about people like Chun Yun, 
who's also a, a legendary party official and revolutionary who, who was able to work behind the scenes, had connections with the military, the security services, the, the, the state planners, and was always there to try and hem in or, const, or, or contain the reform agenda. And vice versa, you had the reformers like Zhao Ziyang and, and Hu Yaobang, who were powerful officials who, when they felt that the conservatives uh, had gone too far, they were there to pull it back. But most importantly, you had Deng Xiaoping, who was sitting atop of it, looking out at this reform agenda, and, and if he felt it was tipping too far one side or the other, would, would reach down uh, with his nicotine-stained fingers and, and revive and, and uh, resuscitate the reform agenda. Uh, I don't see those forces at play anymore precisely because Xi Jinping has came into power with far fewer um, elders behind his back who could be constraining his policy agenda, right? So we can think of uh, a Hu Jintao and, and a Jiang Zemin. Jiang Zemin is 240 years old, and, and, and Hu Jintao is, is not known as being the most uh, a powerful uh, uh, retired party uh, general secretary. Um, so what could change the, the policy agenda? Uh, I do think if China were to see a significant continued economic slowdown that was drastic and rapid, that could rearrange the rearrange the the, the sort of um, um, rearrange the incentives for people within the political system who are fed up with Xi Jinping and are looking for a moment of opportunity to, to create some sort of uh, coalition to push back. If U.S.-China relations continues to careen off off the rails the way it is. It's always been an important policy, uh, a policy objective for a general secretary to at least feel like they're in control of U.S.-China relations. I don't think Xi Jinping probably feels in control of U.S.-China relations. I don't actually know if anyone feels in control of U.S.-China relations. But um, so if you were to see significant deterioration in the relations and in a way that uh, um, opponents within the system who have been waiting for some sort of slip up by Xi Jinping to finally create some sort of coalition, th those two criteria um, could be one. I don't want to even give a uh, half-baked answer on your second question because that's really interesting. So uh, I'd like to think about it, and then we can we can follow up on that. Yeah, it's a great question, though. Uh, way at the back, uh, the green tie. Please wait for the microphone. Good good morning, Jude, and congratulations on your book. It's a great book. Just begun reading it uh, last Saturday. It reads very well. Strongly recommend it. The check is in the mail, Ambassador Guajardo. <laughs> A question following up on, on this past question. We hear a lot uh, that the trade negotiations are used to sort of bring the hardliners on board or to help reform through in China. And, and my question to you is, according to your research, that whole narrative that the trade negotiations are used for reform, is that to nudge the U.S. side along into greater concessions? Or do they actually help bring the Chinese a uh, hardcore Along, yeah, the, the um, you, you hear a couple different things as the as the U.S. U.S. China tensions are going along. One of them, Robert and I were just talking about before, where you hear this joke now of of the uh, the greatest reformers in, in modern Chinese history are Deng Xiaoping and Donald Trump, right? The idea that the idea that uh, Donald Trump has has sort of broken the status quo in China and the pressure that he's putting is putting on China right now is is. Uh, empowering or strengthening some of the reformist elements and that that, that will be enough to sort of um, change the status quo. On the other hand, you hear, you hear people who are saying, no, 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 it's actually the opposite, that as the U.S. makes, makes more aggressive actions towards China, it's actually empowering the, the hardliners. Then you hear people say, no, no, forget all those. Those are just, that's just rhetorical devices the party is using to try and sprinkle pixie dust on us and keep us distracted. Um, I've been criticized by folks in the U.S. government who say, because I have made the, the comment that policy, for example, the, the, when, when we took action against ETE last year, uh, the idea that this was, uh, this was empowering hardliners, I was told that this is just a rhetorical device that Beijing uses, and no doubt it is. It is also the case that it makes perfect sense that that is empowering hardliners in, in Beijing, and, and it's confirming their worldview that you know, China for 60 years has believed in hostile forces and believed that China, that U.S. is hell-bent on a containment strategy um, th that may have been thought of as a little bit more paranoid 10 years ago. Now it's fairly easy to pull enough data points together to, to construct a worldview that that actually is, is U.S. Uh, policy. On the other hand, I also think it's true that pressure by the Trump administration um, is raising the cost of non-reform. Um, and, and I don't want to get into any sort of partisan discussion about Trump's tactics or his personality or whatnot, but just looking at the, looking at the entire chessboard, I think it's clear that 
pressure coming from uh, coming from the administration over the past six months, especially, um, has changed the political calculus in Beijing, and has uh, brought things to the table which twelve months ago I would have said no way Beijing will ever ever consider those. Um, so I, I'm comfortable with Marxist contradictions, and, and those two. Would, would be a good, uh, I think hardliners are being empowered. Their worldview is absolutely being solidified by actions of the Trump administration. You know, adding Huawei to the entity list in the executive order two weeks ago were I, I absolutely, those are just absolutely powerful signals. On the other hand, I think uh, pressure is changing the status quo in, in Beijing. The question is, and we, we just don't know enough about the interworkings of Zhongnan Hai, who, who what does the actual battle behind the scenes look like in terms of, of um, um, what China's playbook is going to be m moving forward? I suspect we're all confused about what's happening in the Trump administration. I suspect Beijing is even more is even more confused uh, about what's going to happen over over the next few weeks. And you've got actions from you know DOJ has the China Initiative, so you've got uh, you've you've got criminal uh, indictments of. Who knows who knows what individuals you've got talk of using the Magnitsky Act against Chinese officials. You've got a couple bills moving their way through Congress right now about blocking Chinese companies uh, from from engaging in economic activity here. You have talk of adding more Chinese firms to the entity list. You know, we, we're now into scary stuff talking about uh, visa bans for Chinese students. I mean, there's just a lot coming out. And so I, I don't think Beijing has a good handle on on on, on where this is going. There's a, a question at the back on the left and then we'll come up front. Thank you, our uh, fantastic speaker and moderator. Um, I'm a journalist working in China for more than seven years for Hong Kong and Taiwan media, and I also interviewed the group you um, like you focus on today. And um, so, from my um, from what I learned, um, you just mentioned the neo Mao. Maoist, who is more maybe from the former generation, like Sima Pingbang and uh, Wu Yu Zhixiang, their uh, website. Um, so I'm interested in whether you have looked into the younger generation of so-called neo Maoists, uh, who maybe actually split uh, split into two groups. One is the uh, social, the radical socialist elite students that uh, our moderator just mentioned, and the other group is uh, a group we call called Little Pink, who is the uh, new nat nationalist, uh, who seem to be more mainstream than the uh, radical socialist. So uh, I'm wondering what's your, um, so what's your observation on this split as well as the genera uh, generational differences uh, in the neo -Mao Maoist group and what that uh, will influence maybe the China politics and U.S.-China relation. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. Um, and, and one of the story, one of the problems with telling a story like Neo Maoism is you realize, you know, in the same way that there's 18 iterations of a Trotskyite, um, you know, Neo Maoism, there's 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 lots of different factions and subgroups, and there's even at the, you know. Even calling it neo Maoism as a cohesive movement is very problematic because you have what's called the Bao Hong Pai and the Zhao Fan Pai. The Bao Hong Pai, the sort of conservative old guard, or the neo Maoists that are more concerned with protecting the regime as it is. The Zhao Fan Pai, the, the, the sort of radicals, uh, still want to basically take down the Communist Party because they think it's so far corrupt. He can't even save it. And, and great point. There's, there's absolutely a generational shift where. You've got this new generation. I, th I think that the, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about these Marxist students uh, and some of the more vocal nationalist neo-Maoists represent a new iteration of, of what neo-Maoism, of, of what neo-Maoist influenced individuals look like. I, I, I don't think, I think the difference is um, the new generation of neo-Maoists is much more dispersed than was previous iteration. So five or six years ago, there were really only a few websites or organizations which served as um, central nodes for the movement. It's become much more dispersed now, in part as a reaction to uh, pushback and crackdown from the Communist Party. Um, a after Bo Xilai was sacked in March of 2012, that same day, essentially all, they call it the Red Massacre, all neo-Maoist websites were, were shuttered. Um, a lot of them never came back online. A few, including this, this one, Utopia, which is the, the most famous one, came back later that year, but, but they'd changed. Um, 
or organizing or have a center, having a central organization now is much more costly and risky. So, so that idea of having these central nodes is now essentially gone, and it's a much more individual, dispersed, uh, neo-Maoist um, movement su such, as it, such as it is. But I would also think an uh, uh, important new iteration of it is the old movement was very nationalist. This one is even more, there's even more nationalist strains to it. Um, and and less tied to the Maoist symbolism, uh, and more just to the sort of nation state. Um, but uh, uh, just for the simplicity of storytelling, I just focused the book on on um, on utopia and, and one strain of neo Maoism because I figured it was taxing enough as it was to get anyone to read anything on neo Maoism. So, can I ask a, a quick follow up on, yeah. on that last point before going back to the audience, especially with the newer neo Maoists? You describe them as beginning with a defense of the virtues of socialism, a concern for the underclass, uh, and the implication is that they're quite sincerely motivated. But now you've also described this interest in national power, yeah. in Chinese greatness, uh, which takes us into the realm of foreign policy and the possible contradiction that much of China's new national power is actually founded in its shift toward capitalism. It's founded yeah, in its wealth. Uh, so how do they... Two, two questions from that. How do they resolve this, their interest in Chinese greatness with the fact that that depends on wealth and, and the move toward capitalism? And two, where, where do they go in foreign policy generally for China? And what does that have to do with socialism, which is their jumping off point? Yeah, that's great. Um, um, unsatisfyingly, there's not a, a, a very coherent uh, uh, sort of set of, there, there's no sort of guiding blueprint of neo-Maoism that has a very accurate or, or, or concise prescriptive foreign policy or economic policy. You, you line up, you know, 30 neo-Maoists and you're going to get slight, you're going to get a lot of variation there. So um, I became very comfortable with contradiction. You, you mentioned a, a great one, which is, look, if you're, you, you can have a 25-year-old neo-Maoist who, who, you know, hates the West, hates capitalism, but of course, they're they're on their their Apple computer and and they're surfing the internet, which in many ways was was facilitated by interaction with Western companies. Um, they don't see a contradiction there. At the point being is, as so long as capital is being um, capital is being deployed for national greatness and with national sovereignty in mind, you get a lot of flexibility and, and, and pragmatism from a lot of these folks. And so, what I noticed is, make an analogy. And again, I don't want to step into partisan waters here, but um, we've seen that. Um, I'll take a personal example that in my family, someone in my family who is a lifelong Republican and until, until a couple years ago was talking to me about the virtues of, of free enterprise and moral righteousness. And, and so I saw very rapidly their, their type of conservatism shift with, uh, with Donald Trump. And that, that was a very natural evolution for them and, and didn't seem that jarring. Um, there's a lot more flexibility in neo-Maoism when they feel like the, the state and the party are working on behalf of China's wealth and power. And whereas 10, 10, 12 years ago, there may have been more of a focus on actual specific social policies. Um, after 2007, 2008, um, global financial crisis, Beijing Olympics, um, after the, the disclosures uh, uh, from Edward Snowden, uh, which again confirmed this idea of China as a hostile, surrounded power, um, after the rise of Xi Jinping, who had a much more uh, vocal articulation of national greatness, uh, a lot of neo Maoists shifted along with that, and suddenly I noticed that they weren't talking about discrete technocratic healthcare policy anymore. It was about finally we've got a leader who's standing up to or articulating forcefully the interests of China on on the world stage. Um, so I've seen that evolution that evolution hap happen as well. Okay, well, we come right uh, down front. Lots of questions, and we'll come over here. Jim Hurd, uh, Green Science Exchange, San Francisco. While we see Xi Jinping moving so strongly toward the force, toward the power of ideology, at the same time, China is committed to its drive and hunger for innovation in 5G, in quantum computing, in science and technology, um, and the the forces that feed innovation are the forces that directly feed against uh, uh, ideology in the long run. And we see uh, Ezra Vogel working on a great new book gradually on uh, Hu Yaobang. So I just want to see how you see this night and day, yin and yang uh, fight going on 
uh, behind the scenes gradually between innovation and ideology. That's great. And that, that's a good follow-up to, to Robert's question just now about these, what appear to be these uh, direct uh, contradictions um, or antagonisms between, on the one hand, control, and on the other hand, in innovative capacity, right? Um, I'll give you the unsatisfying answer is th this has been a balance that the party has always been trying to negotiate, right? And so what we're seeing now is the 2019 version of this, which is how does a, how does a political entity stay in absolute control? What are, the, what are the prerequisites and the necessities and exigencies of that? And how does it maintain enough uh, flexibility uh, for, innovative, for innovation to happen, right? And I think uh, our problem is, or my, my problem is always seeing these in stark contrasts. And so I, I remember as a student in, in Beijing in 2001, absolutely being convinced that the internet was, of course, going to be something which the party basically had to submit to. You just couldn't maintain control and, and, and have an internet spread throughout the country. And gosh, was, was I wrong? Um, because the, the party invested a lot of, of time and effort in making sure that it got many of the benefits uh, of the internet so it could redound to the nation and to the party, but yet it was going to always be uh, finding ways to channel that, uh, uh, um, channel that w away from some of the more dangerous manifestations of it. Um, I suspect we're, we're seeing another one of those inflection points in, in that rebalancing right now because not only is, is, I think we could actually broaden your question to say that the United States is, is undergoing this rebalancing as well in terms of uh, technological innovation, the prerequisites for that, and national security, right? So if you're out in the valley, you're, you're, I mean, we've got export controls coming, you know, uh, upgraded ex export controls coming down the pike. We've got the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., CFIUS, which is looking to block uh, inbound investment out of national security concerns. We're looking at maybe the United States needs more industrial policy. That discussion is happening now to make sure that we can be competing with China in artificial intelligence, in 5G. So uh, in many ways, we're kind of converging in, a, in, a, in the center of uh, a lot of states are looking at the world through a primarily national security lens. And so China is going maybe a more extreme iteration of that. Uh, but I think a lot of nations are, are, are going that way as well. Um, and I, I suspect that you're right in the long run that if we take extremist positions, total ideological control makes innovation well nigh impossible, right? If you have an absolute national security state and you, you don't allow, you know, you've got no immigration, you're all cross-border M&A, you know, flops to zero because there's too much national security scrutiny, investment becomes impossible, export controls mean technology can't be bouncing back internationally, that, that's going to make this very hard. Uh, but China has always shown that it's been able to wiggle out of these contradictions with, uh, with much more success than I think many of us think from an a priori perspective uh, they should be able to. Um, so I realize I just basically kicked the can on your question and didn't answer it, but, but um, I'm good at that. Okay, we, uh, let's try for two lightning rounds because there are a lot of uh, questions out there. So let's take three short questions in the interrogative mode, please. Um, and then we'll go for uh, short answers so that we have a chance. Let's go to this corner. We'll say, uh, here, Madeline, Arnie, you three. Quick questions. Uh, the, we also see China um, moving more aggressively in terms of the South China Sea and other areas. And I wonder what, whether this is where the government can see itself pulling the neo-Maoists together with it and the possibility of, of lack of uh, judgment with regard to pushback uh, either from the U.S. or uh, its allies. But Thank it you. It seems to me there's a danger of that. Then two down, Madeline, and then we'll come up front. Um, yes, hi, Madeline Ross. Could you comment on uh, the role of Western returned scholars, if any, in these neo-Marxist mm -hmm. circles? Okay, then one question. If we could bring the mic up front, please. My name is Arnold Zeitlin. I've been teaching in China. Uh, you keep mentioning Bo Xilai. Uh, is he a factor in the crackdown? Do they fear some kind of resurgence so, uh, in Bo Xilai? Do these people, um, the neo, uh, neo Maoists you talk to, uh, have some appreciation of uh, Bo Xilai? Great, great questions. Unfortunately, two of them are kind of too hard for me to answer. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't have a satisfying answer on the South China Sea issue in terms of how the... I don't think any South China Sea policy pays any attention to the neo-Maoists whatsoever. I, uh, neo Maoists for sure, um, have been very happy with an expansionist foreign policy under, under the Communist Party. To what extent does the Communist Party care about what they think? 
certainly at the margin and insofar as they care about prop propaganda and narrative. Um, but I don't think in terms of actual, you know, strategic policy in the South China Sea, they, they, they give a hoot. Um, same great question about the role of return scholars in the, in the current uh, one. I, I just I actually don't I don't know. Um, and I haven't since this broke out in the summer of last year. Uh, I've been out of China, um, and so I haven't had a chance to engage or, or interview uh, a anyone on that. But that's a that's a great question. But there's no leader of neo Maoism who did a PhD at no. Princeton. There's no, no figure of this kind. And that's a differentiation between the what's called the new left and neo Maoism. The new left, which started in the 1990s, was a movement of re of returnee scholars who had done PhDs in Western social sciences and essentially brought the critiques of capitalism that had been that had evolved in. Uh, in, in Europe, in the UK, and the United States, brought those back and brought those to bear on China's domestic policy at the time. neo Maoists and, and the New Left had a lot of Venn diagram overlap up until the early 2000s, and then the two movements went separate ways. Mm -hmm. New Left stayed in the academic mode. neo Maoism moved more in towards a activist, uh, activist uh, role. And uh, as neo Maoism became much more extreme, um, the, the two essentially have nothing to do with each, with each other a anymore. Um, Bo Xilai is a, a absolutely central figure still. Um, the party has cracked down so hard on any any references to Bo Xilai. Um, I always hear rumors that that the coup will happen when they break Bo Xilai out of prison, and that he'll be the and that some sort of some f uh, leader in waiting who's looking to essentially spark a coup will go will go break him out of jail because the feeling is the the existing wellspring of support for Bo Xilai is still wide, still widespread. Um, he's a celebrated figure amongst neo Maoists. He was the as close as they almost got to power was was Bo Xilai. They threw everything in behind him. Um, they thought he was going to make it to, to the standing committee and be general secretary, and, and they were going to be you know within in the administration. Um, everything on Bo Xilai is censored, and and all the neo Maoist have, websites have scrubbed any reference uh, to that, uh, and because it's become a, a political liability to have pre existing. Articles, articles there, and the party made them uh, scrub it. Final thing is, they do find interesting ways of celebrating him. So, uh, um, you know, they'll sneak in photos of him. They'll do an article on Dalian when he was the leader out there, and they'll sneak in a, a, a photo of him. Uh, so they try and find ways to keep that uh, to keep his memory alive, but um, uh, it, it, it's hard. Let's try for one more lightning round, if we could, um, Brendan, and then right behind, and then. So you've been very patient, way in the back, the middle. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, Brendan Mulvaney, the China Aerospace Studies Institute. It was put to me this week from a Chinese delegation that uh, America tends to be forward-looking, where China currently culturally is backward-looking. So the question is, this was specifically, we talked about movies and then segued into a big cultural debate. So the question is, how are they, or and if so, how are the neo Maoists able to kind of look forward and give the Chinese something to look forward to in the future, whether, or are they simply hearkening back to the glory days of the past mm -hmm. and aren't worried about forward looking? Interesting. Yeah. Hi, uh, Anne Lestrude from Party Watch Initiative. Um, uh, going back to earlier in your talk about the, the role of party cells in different organizations and, and how this was something that was existing before, but kind of left to neglect. I'm, I'm curious if the shift now, is this something that's codified into law or into memorandum, or is this something more like a change in the air, um, something that uh, people have dusted off and now they know they can't ignore mm. anymore? Uh, thank you. Earlier you mentioned the sort of nationalist element to neo Maoism, China's a great power. How does that work or interact with the other foreign policy legacy of Maoism, which is the sort of post anti colonial Cold War era? How do, are there any tensions between that and, say, China's great power initiatives? Great question. Those are all great questions. Um, it's all, we've always sort of framed uh, any sort of Maoist nostalgia as a very backward looking sort of foot stuck in the past. Um, I, I, I suppose it's, you know, every, most nations have, um, have, have sort of organizing stories and myths. Uh, we in the United States certainly have one. We celebrate the founding fathers. Um, you know, the Tea Party movement, for example, you know, you, you have people dressed up as Thomas Jefferson. It wasn't that they were actually looking to implement policy of, of 1787. It was about remembering and, and staying rooted to first principles or organizing principles. It's also about claiming sort of the rhetorical high ground by saying we're more, you know, we're more Chinese than you are because we're, we're tying our policies to, uh, to, to, to Mao. Um, 
so so beyond this the symbolic um, the symbolic uh, um, the symbolism of Maoism, um, I, I don't I don't think there's any or tying into older ideas, let's say by self sufficiency, right, or or indigenous innovation, or I mean, those are very old ideas uh, of. You know, the world's a hostile place. China needs to build up its industrial base. That way, its indigenous industrial base, that way it will be able to defend itself against uh, 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 hostile forces. That, that's, a, that's an old discussion, but I think framing that as a sort of, a, as a backward looking um, uh, policy, I think misses the nuances and complexities of um, all nations tie themselves to founding principles in, to some degree while also looking to the future. And, and, and just on the ground in China, I don't see any meaningful manifestation of a, of a backward look. Um, it's sort of a, a, a can kick and your great question as well, but um, um, yeah. Um, party cells, so it's always been stated, it's always been the stated policy in the party constitution that it, that, which is the, the party charter is the highest um, legal documents, not the right word. It's in, in the echelon of hierarchical documents, the party charter stands above all the other ones. It's always been the case that, or at least since 1992, that uh, uh, any, or, any organization, entity, bureaucracy, you name it, that has three or more party members uh, has to have a cell. Um, the company law of 1992 also codified that any foreign firm coming into the country had to permit um, uh, a party cell, left it very vague about what, what that meant. That was long passive, dormant, uh, not implemented, and it was really in um, mid 2000s that there was a big effort by Hu Jintao into party building, Dangjian, that they started to try to make some progress on the issue of party cells. But like so many other Hu Jintao initiatives, it just didn't get anywhere. Um, 2013 January, Xi Jinping comes to power in one of his first, uh, the third Politburo meeting he ever he ever held. Uh, he came out again with a policy saying, no, this time we're going to take it seriously. Uh, we're going for, quote unquote, full coverage. Um, and we're going to get party cells into everything. And starting in 2013, you had a, a series of guidelines issued um, that were looking to put, uh, to put um, uh, meat on the bones of that policy. This is really interesting to listen to. But, uh, and, and finally, I'll just say that the, the real break year was 2015, where they weren't getting as much movement in the private sector as they wanted to, so they started with SOEs and essentially uh, threatened and wagged the stick at SOEs saying, you got to take the lead on this. And that's when you really start to see the cascade, cascade of action, including foreign companies that were in joint ventures with SOEs who startly ha started to have the SOE come to them and say, hey, let's rewrite the Articles of Association to give the, the party, uh, uh, party organization more power. Won't that be fun? Um, and so that was the that was the, the the progress of it, and now it's got enough in, uh, um, momentum behind it uh, that that you're really seeing you're really seeing the the push come come towards full uh, full coverage, as they say. Um, it's a great question. I don't even have a half baked answer. Um, that's I feel like someone's doing a PhD dissertation on that. So and probably in this room. So I don't even. It's a great it's a great question. I just don't have a a, a pithy answer. There was a fair amount of pith in the past hour. Um, that's okay. Well, thanks to all of you for coming out today, and thanks to Jude again. The book, China's New Red Guards, which I should also mention, is very well written. I found this a pleasure to get through, and it doesn't take you through all of the details of Communist Party bureaucracy or the arcana uh, of all of the ideology. It's a very good – no, 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 no. It's not it's – not, but it's not it's, – it's a good narrative uh, that I think you'll find very readable. And I know that uh, for me it was – it both helped me to understand what, where we are in the relationship now, but it was also a wonderful reminder of a number of dynamics in the intellectual history of China and in the way that we've been working with and against China over the past 40 years. So, Jude, thank you so much. Thank and thanks to all of you. Thank you.